Good morning and welcome to Inniswood Baptist Church this morning. If you are new here, we thank you for joining us online. If you are joining us for our Facebook watch party, don't forget to say hello so others know you are watching along with them. We are so happy you are here and can't wait to be together again soon. A special happy Father's Day to those that are celebrating. No matter your relationship with earthly fathers, this day is a great reminder of our Heavenly Father as well. We are so blessed to have a Heavenly Father who's, who loves us unconditionally. I hope that you know that love and are open to receiving that love on a daily basis. If you do not know God's love, I do hope and pray that God will bless you as you watch this service and you will want to learn more. Please reach out if you want to know more. Before we head into our service, I want to introduce you to our speaker for today. Jody Cross returns for a second sermon in this four-part series. If you didn't get to watch last week's sermon, please feel free to go to our website to find it under sermons on video. Jody is a pastor here in Barrie at South Shore Bible Church. Jody has been in pastoral ministry for 32 years in various capacities, as well as is a recording artist and worship director. In fact, he led a worship seminar here at Inniswood back in 1999. We are so thankful that Jody has offered to preach for us again this week. He continues to speak to us about how God is still in control. As we head into worship, our call to worship comes from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. A love that's never failing Let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of a Savior
God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered.
Good morning, Inniswood Baptist Church. Hey, it's good to be with you again. Happy Father's Day to you. Hope you're enjoying your day. God bless you dads as you're watching. Uh, my wife, Alex, and I have four children that uh, used to be little, but now they're ages 22 to 27. And the good news is they're getting older, but I'm not. Uh, I, wish, I wish that was. So I hope you have a great day today. And we're thankful for, for dads. Well, last week we began a new four-week series in Acts 16 that calls us to see with eyes of faith that God is still in control. My wife, Alex, often reminds me, she says, you know, Jody, she said, Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And that's good. I need to be reminded of that. Just, we all need to be reminded that God is a big God and he's doing great things at all times, even in these times. Even in these times, do you believe that? Uh, God's sovereign, he's wise, and he's loving over viruses and governments, and he's, he's sovereign and he's wise over his church. Knowing that, uh, we can rest in our God who's sovereign, knowing that he's good and that he has a good plan. That's what we saw last week. We affirm that. Uh, we affirm that he moves us along, even using closed doors, and then even leading us through open doors to be part of what he's doing. We can rest in that and trust in him and be at peace. Uh, do you need some of that today? I, I prayed that, I said, Lord, would you bless this body of believers with that, Lord? Uh, give us your peace. Help us to be at rest and to trust you. Well, we're gonna see what we can be encouraged by today as we trace out the steps as God leads this group of disciples forward. Acts 16, I'll give you a little bit of a recap from what we talked about last week. This was the beginning of Paul's three-year second missionary journey that covered 500 miles around the Mediterranean. It's, a, it's an exciting story. God led them to Troas, and he had just some amazing things to unleash for them. And by the way, God doesn't always give us, in fact, rarely does he give us the entire roadmap for the journey. He just gives us enough light, enough direction for the next step and the next step. And that, that keeps us trusting in him and not in our, in our plans or in our roadmaps. Paul received that vision in the Macedonian call, and that was a happy ending. But it actually wasn't an ending, it was really just the beginning. And this was more, much more about the lessons in following God's guidance and walking with him in obedience. And, and those things are important too, and that's worthy of another sermon, how God leads us. But there was something much greater happening, and we talked about that. This was the beginning of the new work in this uncharted, unreached continent of Europe. This was about God establishing a new churches in new strategic centers such as Philippi and right after this Thessalonica and Corinth and Rome. And it all started right here in the providential working of God in the life of these four obedient servants and we're gonna see one beloved woman. We pick up our story today in Acts chapter 16. Would you take your Bibles and open them up there? We're gonna to look today at verses 11 to 15. Acts 16 verses 11 to 15. Hear now the word of the Lord. So setting sail from Troas, we made direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in the city some days, and on the Sabbath day we went outside to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women who had got, come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia, from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. After she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I look back over my journey of following Jesus, a journey that started in Ottawa where I was born. My ministry journey began in Ottawa. God led us and our family to Newmarket and from there to Orangeville and from there to Barrie where we are still 20 years later. What does the geographical journey of your life look like? Not, not only of your, your life but your faith life as well. It's actually quite amazing to look back and see how and where God has led us. Well, the God who is still in control and that's the the name of this series, God is still in control. He moved, and he moves people even today. We see in this text that God moved Paul, first point, across the sea. You see that in verse 11. Uh, they set sail from Troas, and they landed in Neapolis, and from there to Philippi. 
Once Paul had seen the vision and they had concluded that this was God's will and his open door for them, Paul and his three companions, they found the ship headed for Macedonia and they embarked on a 150 mile journey uh, from Troas and they stopped at Samothrace, which was a mountainous island in the middle of the Aegean Sea and there they dropped anchor and they stayed overnight before heading to Neapolis, the seaport on the Macedonian coast. If you think back to Acts chapter 9, when God called Ananias to go pray for Saul, who was newly converted, God's uh, directions and his call to Ananias were very, very specific. But here in the Macedonian call, God's direction was, was pretty general. It was pretty vague. Uh, you know, God said, go to Macedonia. That would be like you getting a call and saying, go to Saskatchewan. Uh, Lord, is there a, a city or a town? Do I have a cell phone number or contact meeting me at the airport? There was none of that. Well, off they went with, with very little direction, but they went in faith and it was a big walk of faith, expecting that as they went, God would give them the, the next step and the next little bit of light and the next leading on where they were supposed to go. And he did, and he does. And we need to be okay with that. Uh, we don't need to have the whole picture laid out for us like a, a Google Maps doc that says, here's A, here's B, and here's the, the 17 intervening steps. God will lead us, and we stay dependent upon him. Well, God is going to lead us, and we just need to be like those, those Israelites who put their, their toe in the Jordan River. They didn't know how the river was going to open. They didn't know what lay beyond the river, but they just had to take the first step. And so this is what Paul did. They, they took that first step. They got in the boat. We need to take that first step. Well, the missionaries on the ship made really good time. It was a two-day journey for them. They had favorable winds at their back, and it was as if God was saying, I'm going to be behind you, you guys. I'm going to push you forward when these big winds, and you're going to get there really soon. That was some encouragement that was needed, and God is good just to give us those little bits of encouragement when we feel weary and discouraged. So eventually they landed quickly in Neapolis, and they traveled 10 miles inland to the Macedonian plat plateau to the city of Philippi. Here they were at last, by land and by sea, in total 500 miles on foot, 150 miles by sea. This was a 650 mile journey. Wow, God was leading them. And so now they say, Lord, now what? We're here, what do you have for us here? I think this is the place we're supposed to be. Was this by chance or God, is this by your hand? Well, they believed in the providence of God and so should we. They believed that God was the creator over all creation and he was purposely involved with his creation. You know, he's not an absentee landlord. He doesn't just go away and leave us alone. He was directing their very thoughts, their very actions, their very steps. As you look back over your life, do you marvel how God has led you? Maybe even how you ended up in this city. Maybe how you ended up in this church. It led you in how how you work and what your vocation is led you to the person you were to marry. You see, through circumstances, God always leads us from A to B, and we don't always understand it, we don't always see it. At the time, we don't understand the big picture of what's going on, where all this is leading, but this is the providence of God. And maybe that's a new concept for you. John Piper is helpful. He says this, he explains providence in this way. Listen, he said, the providence of God is his purposeful sovereignty by which he will be completely successful in the achievement of his ultimate goal for the universe. Every little detail in the hand of God, God's purposeful sovereignty and his plan is gonna be completely successful, not only in our lives, not only in the church, but in the entire cosmos, in the entire universe, entirely across time and history and space. This is who our God is. He's a big God. He's a God that we can worship and we can trust him. And I don't know if you ever feel like your life is the, the sum total of a bunch of random events. That the ship that you're sailing in gets pushed and directed according to whatever direction the winds are blowing in. It's just like fate. Well, let me tell you, it's not random. It's not by chance. Everything that happens is according to God's plan and purposes. It's God working in all things for our good and for his glory. In providence, God brought these people a long way in this adventure of faith for a very specific reason. 
God was about to show them what that reason was. And God moved Paul across the sea to the seaport to the outskirts of the town where God was moving in the heart of a woman, a woman that would open her heart to receive the message of salvation and become the first convert on European soil. That's the first point. Providentially, God moved Paul across the sea. Second, God, who was still in control, was also moving Lydia, this beloved woman, to the riverside. That's the second point. He was moving Lydia to the riverside. Have you ever played with Google Earth? Right, you start with a big picture of the globe of our Earth, and then you can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, and you can zoom in so much, so close, that you end up in your own backyard. You take the street view and you go, hey, there's my car in the driveway, the car I used to have. Well, we could Google Earth zoom in, and God zooms in right to this very riverside, right to this place where these women were gathering for prayer. Look at verse 13. On the Sabbath day, we went outside, this is Paul, or actually this is Luke writing, we went outside to the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. Jewish population of Philippi was so small that there was no synagogue. And so this group of of faith-filled women found an alternate place to gather and to worship. And they were outside, just about a mile outside the city. It was a place of prayer. It was next to the Gangites River. You can actually see that on a map today. Uh, The journey had led them this far to this place into this group of women and and one particular woman on Google Earth, it wasn't just that they were in this particular physical space beside this river, it zooms in even closer if we could just focus in on the face of this woman, Lydia. Luke gives us quite a bit of information about her. She was from Thyatira, she was from the city in the Lycus Valley in Asia Minor, about 300 miles from Philippi. So not only had God brought Paul and his companions 650 miles, he brought her 300 miles also across the sea to this city because something very special was about to happen. Somewhere along the way she left her home, we don't know if she was given a new sales territory. We don't know if things back home were bad. Uh, We don't know exactly what happened. Uh, But she potentially even had a pioneering spirit, an entrepreneurial spirit. And you see, she was a wealthy merchant Uh, The Bible tells us that she was a seller of expensive purple cloth that would have been purchased and worn by royalty or political officials, people who had money. And she had a lucrative business and it kept her and her staff busy, but it didn't keep them so busy that they neglected nurturing their faith. There's a bit of a reminder for us that we can be so busy sometime in our vocation that our uh, pursuing God uh, gets neglected. Well, sometimes God brings someone to, to faith over a series of steps and over a period of time. And this was, this was true of me. I can look back now and see God working in my life uh, over a, at least a 10-year period. And I can identify things and circumstances and events and people that God brought into my life even though I didn't know him. Until finally, he opened my eyes and opened my heart and I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. It was when I was uh, 15 years old. That's for another story and another time. But how many people did God use in your life? How many circumstances and things as you look back can you identify as God brought you to the place where you would hear the gospel and surrender your life, turning your life over to Jesus? Well, Paul's custom when he arrived in a city was to go to the local synagogue and to teach. He was trained as a Pharisee and he would be invited to speak as someone who had authority. And he would tell of the gospel of Jesus Christ until they kicked him out or beat him up or threw him in jail. That's, that's what he did. But there was no synagogue here, so he couldn't go there. So logically, they assumed they would go to find some people who at least were God-word, and that's who they met. Uh, they believed that God had led them across what is now modern-day Turkey, across the Aegean Sea, to this specific city, to this specific place for a reason. Lord, what is it? God, and we ask that question, you know, Lord, what is it that you're trying to teach us right now? Lord, what is it that you're trying to teach me? What is it that you're trying to show me? Lord, where is it that you want to lead me? Where is it that you want to lead us as a church right now? We want to be that intuitive in just in in saying that to the Lord and in in surrendering our, our agendas and our plans to him. And so it just happened, 
It just happened that God was doing some great things. He was doing something, opening the door and opening the heart of an individual to believe. And it just so happened that on that Sabbath day, in God's providence that is, that God brought Paul and and Timothy and Silas and Luke to meet Lydia with these other women to the place of prayer at the water's edge just outside the city limits. Providentially, God moved Lydia to the riverside. And the third thing I wanna say is that God who was still in control was also moving in Lydia's heart to believe. That's the third thing. And it just reminds me what great lengths God goes to to save people. Think about what we've been talking about for the last two weeks. The frustrations, the closed doors, eventually the open door, the persistence of these missionaries. So, so many lack, so, many just, so much lacking in sign and, and in confirmation this is where they were supposed to be. But, but this was all leading somewhere. The big funnel was leading to this moment. He did all of that with these men for this one woman. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God so loved Lydia that he would move in the lives of these men and he would direct their steps and their journey and lead them providentially so that she could hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you well up in your heart with how God blessed you with the gospel because of what he did in someone else's life to preach Christ to you? Are you thankful today for the grace of God? For Luke chapter 19 says this, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Oh, the grace and the goodness of God and how he moves, leading them all the way. This is the love and the grace of God at work in the life of a woman. The love and the grace of God at work in the life of a lost sheep. One that God goes after to bring home. And that's, that's a wonderful story, but that's just the story of another story. The bigger story is this. This is the picture of the journey taken by the Son of Man. He came from heaven to earth, becoming one of us, becoming like us coming to the place where we are to tell us of our need, to tell us of his love, his salvation, his grace, his mercy, and to turn from sin in order that we might have life in his name through his death, through his shed blood. Brothers and sisters, this is the gospel. What great lengths God has gone to in order to save us. You say amen to that today and just, Lord, we wanna say thank you for your love. And usually people don't come knocking, on order ask, come knocking on our door asking how they can be saved. Usually we need to go to them and this is exactly what Paul did. Paul spoke and the women listened and of all of the women who gathered and heard, uh, the Bible records that only Lydia believed. She really listened to Paul's words that day and it, it struck a chord, it made sense. Her eyes were open, her ears were open, her heart was opened. And this message of salvation, the gospel, found great soil in her heart. Well, what was the difference that day? Why was it that, that she heard and, and believed and they didn't? Was it because Paul was on his game? Was it because his teaching style particularly clicked with her learning style? Well, look at verse 14. It says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. The Lord opened her heart That's what made the difference. And this is the only time in scripture that this phrase is used. God enabled Lydia to heed Paul's message. She listened, she heard, and she responded to the gospel because the Father was at work in her life by his spirit opening her heart. We refer to this as the effectual call. It is understood as God's sovereign drawing of a sinner to repentance. And that's, that's what we pray for, for our, our friends and our loved ones, our children who don't know Jesus. Lord, would you call them? God, would you sovereignly draw this individual who is walking apart from you to salvation? God is absolutely sovereign in the work of salvation. He ordains the means and he ordains the ends. 
In this case, God ordained the means of these men coming to this place at the right time with Lydia there. And whatever God had been doing up in Lydia's life, we don't have record of that, but she left her home and she traveled and she was there and it was this morning and it was a, it was a particular day and God set everything up. It was the perfect timing. He ordained the means and he ordained the ends that in that moment she would hear and believe. And only God can quicken a heart that's dead in sin. Only God can open up the heart, but he uses us, his messengers, to share, to preach the good news, to say that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died for our sins. And the message came through Paul, but the saving power was the Lord's working. We can do our part, we need to do our part, we need to sow the seed, we need to water the seed, but it's only the Holy Spirit that can bring the conviction and to produce a receptive heart. When we think about evangelism, most of us kind of want to turn and go the other way because we're not good at it, we don't like it, we're scared of it, we're afraid that we don't have the answer. But let me encourage you this morning by this, what is successful evangelism? What is it? You see, ultimately, seeing a soul saved, we need to understand this in a holistic way. May I suggest to you today that successful evangelism is working alongside with God where he's working, where he is at work, taking the initiative and the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. Maybe I can even just make that a little bit shorter. Successful evangelism is taking the initiative and the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. In other words, we step up, we step forward, God leads us, we speak, he gives us an open door, and we do our part to speak of Jesus, of the testimony that we have, of his, of his word, of the need for people to be saved, and we watch what God will do. You see, it's not us who changes the heart, it's not us who opens the heart, it's not us who forces someone to believe and be saved, it's the working of God. We can do that, right? We can pray, we can act, we can speak, and we can trust the Lord to do what only he can do. That's successful evangelism. And there's this interplay between our initiative and the work of God, our responsibility, and God's responsibility. And until God is at work in the life of a person, they won't see, they can't hear, they won't understand or believe. But when God is at work in the life of a person, they will be like a magnet, or just they will be you know, magnetized and drawn to God, their hearts will be drawn, their ears will be unstopped, their eyes will be open, they will see. I think about that in my own life. I was told you when I was 15, I came to, to Christ, and I ended up literally being drawn just to this church. Uh, it was weird, it didn't make sense uh, for lots of reasons, and I wasn't saved, but God was drawing me, and he was wooing me, and I could feel my heart beginning to warm up to spiritual things. John 6, says this, no one can come to the Father unless the Father who sent me draws him. And so we can pray, God, would you draw people? Uh, we pray that, Lord, would you save people in our city? Would you save people in our neighborhoods? Father, would you draw the hearts of young people and men and women who need Jesus Christ? God, that's our burden, that's our passion. The resurrected Jesus opened up his word to the disciples on the road to Emmaus and their hearts burned with fire as he shared the truth of them. Luke 24, 45 says, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. In a very similar way, he opened Lydia's heart. He, op he opened their minds. Well, Lydia was appointed to eternal life and she believed. And she was set apart from the creation of the world to know Jesus Christ and to be saved. God was preparing her all of those years and even before the foundation of time for this moment. This was the zoom in moment where she heard and she understood and she believed and she repented and she was baptized, she was saved. And just imagine that you're the Apostle Paul. What an unimaginably joyous moment for Paul and his companions, when at the end of his gospel presentation, seeing God at work in her life, he flicked the switch in her life and she believed and she put her faith in Jesus. And she trusted the Lord to save her, right? The Bible says that all the angels in heaven rejoice when a sinner comes home. And here it was, this big journey culminated in this moment, this woman was saved. And you know what, guess what? We're gonna meet Lydia one day in heaven. We're gonna get to meet her in heaven. We're gonna hear of the story of what God did in her life. As customary in, in the early church, Lydia, along with her household, we're not told the details, but she became an evangelist to 
those in her household, maybe her children, maybe those who worked with her in her business, her servants. But they were baptized. And, you know, there was a river right there, right, right there beside where they were praying. So let's go. Come on, let's do this. And baptism was this outward sign, this identification with Jesus. It's, it's what believers do to tell the world that they're following Jesus Christ. And Lydia's name appears in the Bible. This first convert in Europe, uh, one of only eight people in the book of Acts by name who are called, and I, I think she's the, perhaps the only woman in, in the book of Acts who by name is, is told that she gives her life to Christ. Now our names aren't written in, in the book of Acts, our names aren't written in the Bible, but listen, here's what's much more important. The question is this, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life today? You see that in Revelation 13, eight. Is your name written as one who has become a child of God, who has surrendered your life to follow Jesus Christ? Is your name there? Has your name been there written before the foundation of the world? It needs to be. It needs to be. Eternity depends on it. Well, as an excited, newly saved, freshly baptized, contagious, joy-filled believer, and don't you love new believers? Don't you love the joy and the excitement and the exuberance? They want to share the gospel with everybody. They can't stop telling people about the love of Jesus and how he's changed their lives. We need, we need new and fresh doses of that, don't we? Well, this is who she was. And she was sharing the gospel sharing with those around her, with her household, and she also wanted to to do something else. She wanted to share her resources, and she wanted to serve this church as a good steward. She had a lot to share. Very likely, she was wealthy. She had a big house. She could offer these guys food and lodging, and she opened her home, insisting that Paul and his companions come and stay with her and her family. She had a big enough home, we know, uh, a big enough to accommodate these four, so that's like a couple of rooms, And uh, there would be the addition of some new converts, and we're going to see that in a couple of weeks. There would be even more people, and she would open up her home not only to these four to stay and to eat, but her house would become the first house church in Europe. So God used and blessed, he used what he had blessed her with, and she was willing to share that with the church. What an encouragement for us to be open-handed and generous in the work of God that God calls us to. Well, imagine a videographer, if there was one in those days, traveling with Paul and his team, capturing this journey, uh, you know, a, a vlog along the way, asking Paul this question, saying, Paul, as he interviews him, puts a microphone in his face, saying, Paul, it's taken you a lot of time to get here. It's been hard. It, it's been quite a sacrifice. Paul, was it worth it? And the microphone is put up to Paul's face. What's Paul going to say? He's going to say, worth it. Of course, without a doubt. He would say this. He would say, I would do it all over again. I would do 650 more miles. I would follow God for one sinner who would repent and turn, who believed the gospel. Paul would say this, he'd say, a lost sinner has been found and been brought home. A dead person has been brought back to life. And let me ask you the question today. What is, it, what is your heart for the lost today? If you're a person who knows Jesus Christ, is sure of your salvation, you're, you're sure you're saved. That's absolutely wonderful, and I celebrate that, and we rejoice together in our, in our being secure in the hand of God. Uh, but what about the people that live next to you? What about the people that you work with? Uh, do you share that, that burden for the loss, that passion for the lost? Is it worth it, the sacrifice? to get out of your comfort zone, to go where God calls you to speak when he calls you to speak. May we be people who are Acts 1-8 witnesses, empowered by the Holy Spirit. God was moving, moving all the way to Macedonia, opening a door at this place of prayer, moving in Lydia's heart, moving in, in Europe and moving in this city. Will we be moved by the things that move the heart of God? And this would let me ask you this question. Will you be moved by the things that move the heart of God? Ralph Winter, who is the founder of the U.S. Center for World Mission, says this. The Bible consists of a single drama. The entrance of the kingdom, the power and the glory of the living God in this enemy-occupied territory. And that's why we pray as the church 
as believers who have been enlisted to go and make disciples of every nation, to teach the things that Jesus has taught us. This is the drama. This, this is what life is about. This is why God has called us. This is why he saved us. It's not to be comfortable. It's not to settle in until we, we go home to be with Jesus. It's to be on mission in enemy-occupied territory, to pray for the lost, to go and find those hearts that he has opened, and to be dangerous for the kingdom of God, to be spirit-filled men, men and women, loving Jesus and loving his word, going to the places that he sends us. And whenever we go, moved by God, led by God, empowered by the Spirit, we are looking for open doors. We are looking for open hearts. We're looking for the places that God would lead us to as carriers of the kingdom, the power and the glory of the living God in this enemy-occupied territory. God went to great lengths to save humanity. He went to great lengths to save us, the death of his son. And he sends us now to share the gospel with those who he is saving. What a privilege. I pray that God would give you opportunity to share the gospel. Leave the results to God. I pray that God would, would give you the opportunity somewhere, someday, to leading someone to Jesus Christ, to inviting them to bow their head and to pray, to open their heart to receive Christ, to put their faith in him. As you've been studying over the last two weeks, this Acts 16, these last two stories, do you, do you see the Great Commission tie-in? The Great Commission of Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. And those words that we could pick up these verbs, go, teach, baptize, and disciple. That's exactly what's happening here in Acts 16. Go. Oh, they, they, they went all right. They were on the go. They were teaching. There was baptism. And they were discipling this this woman and her household, and there would be more. And this was a long journey, but it was the fulfillment of Jesus' commandment to his disciples just before his ascension to to go and make disciples. And even in these times that are difficult, even in COVID, even in lockdowns, even these last 15 months, God is still saving people. Uh, Even when our world or our church is spinning, God is still saving the lost. Do you believe that? Let's not lose our vision for the mission In the season of disillusionment and anxiety, God is going ahead of you to prepare the way to open hearts and to open doors. And so let me encourage you to pray for the advancement of the gospel, to pray for the spirit of God to move in the hearts of the people that he is touching. Pray for God to send messengers and and even pray for yourself to be one of those messengers that God would send to these people. Brothers and sisters, you are great commissioned people We are Great Commission Church. You are one of those that God sends to those he intends to save. Let God move you. Let God move you. He is still in control. Let God control your life. Let God move you. Let him move your heart to love. Let him move your feet to go. And let him move your lips to speak the words of eternal life for his glory. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, I want to thank you today for uh, those who are watching, uh, for those who have new life in Jesus Christ and who are confident that they have eternal life, that they will be with you forever. Lord, would you rekindle in all of our hearts the passion for the lost? Lord, would you give us opportunities and conversations and relationships? And would you bring us, Lord, near those who, who need you, And would you help us, Lord, give us the courage to speak. God, give us a heart for the lost. Uh, Give us the power to live and speak in such a way that commends the gospel to a broken world. I pray, Lord, for your glory that you would create opportunities for Inniswood to impact their community with the gospel. And Lord, would you do the work that you can do and would you enable us to do the work that you call us to do. We celebrate, Lord, changed lives. Lord, we ask that we would be part of that and give you praise. And all God's people in the name of Jesus said, amen. Thank you, Jody, for your second message. Next week, um, we will have another uh, speaker with us uh, from Jody's church uh, who will be continuing this message um, 
in the third part. Now, as it's the end of our service, typically when we're in person on Father's Day, we'd be handing all the men um, some dad's cookies. Um, it's a tradition here at Inneswood. Uh, we're sorry we can't do that online, uh, but we hope you're able to uh, maybe enjoy um, something special uh, on your own. Uh, I'm gonna leave you with a blessing over you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. We'll see you next week.